Good evening. It's my great pleasure to be able to introduce you to uh, a, uh, a lecture which uh, has been organized by the SOAS China Institute. And uh, the speaker tonight is actually a SOAS person, <laughs> just on, uh, on loan in other places. But uh, yeah. Charles, uh, Dr. Charles Manson is. Um, uh, a librarian is um, works for the libraries uh, of um, the, the Bodleian Library in Oxford and also the British Library, a few steps away from here, and is thoroughly familiar with our own library collection, uh, not least the Tibetan materials, which uh, uh, he has been looking at. Um, I'm uh, extremely happy to see uh, all of you here this evening. Um, I know that some of you have an interest in, uh, uh, in studies which. Uh, uh, referred to Inner Asia and then also um, the um, empires of uh, uh, surrounding China and China itself. So it's a, um, uh, this is uh, something that, of course, uh, uh, over time changes. And those of you who have experience, who have uh, a professional interest in, um, in uh, Tibet will know that uh, uh, it changes shape and it changes uh, uh, also culturally over time. But I'm going to um, not say much more uh, than this, and I'm, uh, I would like to remind you that any questions that you have, unless they're immediate questions concerning uh, audibility or anything, um, uh, we should discuss at the end, and um, uh, I uh, I'm sure that there will be many questions. I already have a few, just having looked at the book. Yes, of course, I should say that two, a couple of words about the book as well, uh, which is um, uh, has been authored by uh, uh, Charles Manson, um, which is uh, uh, copies of which can be uh, inspected here at the uh, at the desk, and uh, uh, which are probably available at our bookshop too. If not, I'm going to make sure that. It will be. Um, uh, and here you have to correct me if I'm mistaken. Did you do a, um, a, a, an introduction to a, a Tibetan document which is available on YouTube or on, um, in the, or on the British Library website? Uh, yes. Yes, because I came, I came across that some weeks ago, but I wasn't sure. I wasn't 100% sure about it. Okay, so uh, do, do write, do search the uh, uh, British Library website, and uh, you will find a, a wonderful introduction to uh, a, a Tibetan manuscript. So, having said this, I won't say anything more until the end, um, and I would like to pass the word to Charles Mans for his lecture. Good evening. Lovely to see you all here, and uh, thank you for the invitation and for the introduction as well, very kind introduction. Um, yes, so the genesis of the living Buddha tradition, and I hope you know living the tradition, Dalai Lama. So, and where it uh, begins, uh, and we're going to look at that today, because it's, uh, although Kamapashi is often called the first reincarnation in terms of the reincarnate Lamas, um, it's not entirely uh, accurate, but it serves as a good uh, marker. So if you have to find somebody who uh, you could say is the first reincarnation of the Tibetan tradition, then uh, come up actually is as good as any. Um, I'm going to end with. Oh, yeah. uh, yes, going to look a little bit at the context, uh, the biography of Kamapakshi, a little bit at his writings uh, and his legacy. So the biography, the writings, and his legacy are in the book, some of the writings anyway. Uh, you know, just I extracted some and a bit about his uh, significance as, as well. So firstly, the geographical context, uh, he operated 
from uh, this area initially for the first half of his life, uh, went into central Tibet, then up here, right into, uh, well, into West China, and then up to Mongolia, across uh, to Almadik over here, and then right across again to uh, Shangdu or Xanadu. So, and then back to Tibet. Uh, so that was uh, quite a lot of uh, traveling and quite a lot happened in the time. So he was born near Dege here, uh, spent the first half of his life there, uh, went to uh, Sopu near Lhasa, and then went to Siwai uh, shortly, uh, went up to West China, Northeast Tibet, and then went up to Karakoram, across to Almanek after some time, uh, and then back along the uh, Silk uh, route, uh, and then was imprisoned, uh, well, captured, should we say, uh, they attempted to execute him, didn't work, and then he was uh, put in exile uh, near uh, Zandu, Shandu, and then uh, later was released and uh, came back to his homeland, and then to Serpul, where he eventually died. So the historical uh, context, just very briefly, uh, some of you will know it very well, uh, but you may not, some of you may not know, Tibet had an empire, uh, began really in, this is just taking it as a sort of apogee in the 820 of the uh, common era, uh, began in the seventh century, 630 is a, a good enough date. So it lasted for about 200 years and then began to uh, collapse with the assassination of Langdama in uh, 842. And during that time uh, of the, the Tibetan Empire, uh, they became, certainly from the first emperor, became interested in Buddhism. Buddhism had not come, as far as we know, to Tibet uh, until the seventh century. They got to China in the second century. They went round the mountains and uh, round the, the Tibetan plateau, came to uh, China, but it didn't really uh, get into Tibet until the seventh century. They had no writing until the seventh century. Uh, and the, <coughs> excuse me, the, uh, uh, some of the emperors were interested in uh, Buddhism and some weren't. Uh, so it, it's not all uh, Buddhist uh, situation in, in the empire all the time. Uh, but then in 842, Langdama was assassinated and there was a sort of collapse of central authority. And as far as we know, there wasn't nearly as much interest in Buddhism. Uh, it may have just you know, gone down to the village level, perhaps being preserved that way, but uh, it certainly wasn't a court religion anymore. And then there was a revival in the late 10th century, the rekindling of the embers, so to speak, it's a famous quote, uh, where you get uh, in amongst other uh, monks coming from uh, Northeast Tibet to revive the uh, monastic tradition, but you get translators going south to India and then coming back with texts and teachings. It's a huge project uh, that not very well organized, I mean, it was individual translators, but they were interested in transferring Buddhism at the time in India into Tibet. Uh, and a certain degree of what are called termas who rediscovered a literature from the imperial period as well. Because you have, uh, between the decline of the empire in 842 until the late 10th century, got about 150 years uh, period of used to be called dark period, but um, it's now called the intermediary uh, period. Uh, dark, it doesn't sound so good. Um, and then uh, the monasteries start to be established in the uh, 11th century. And the, in the meantime, so we got, we go forward another 200 years to when Kamapakshi actually lived in 1204 uh, to 1283, uh, you've got the invasion of northern India by Islam. So Buddhism rapidly declining in northern India. Uh, so this transfer had occurred for about two, uh, 
200 years of Buddhism into Tibet just before it disappeared, well, almost disappeared from India. So it was quite fortuitous in a way, but it was, a, it was the particular type of uh, Buddhism that existed in, in the uh, 10th, well, 11th and 12th centuries. And uh, we have in the 13th century, the death of uh, further north of Tibet, uh, Genghis Khan, Genghis Khan. Uh, so you've got this sort of world and you've got the, uh, the two Song um, empires as well, the two Song divisions in China. This is the world in which uh, Kamapakshi was born into. So here, just a sample of some of the monasteries that start to be uh, created in this rekindling period uh, from a thousand until um, Kamapakshi's birth. Uh, Tulling, probably the, uh, it is the earliest. Um, the other one that's very important to Kamapakshi is uh, Surpu and uh, Katok. Uh, he had some education. There's also, there are also some uh, lesser monasteries in this area that were also important to him. This is the area, there's Katok again, uh, and there's there again, uh, that he grew up in and spent the first half of his life. And these monasteries here, Karmagurn, Kampunena, and Pangpuk, were important uh, to him much later on, once he'd become established. Uh, he would have helped revive them from his previous incarnation, uh, which it had been quite a long time since uh, the previous incarnation had died. And so the monasteries have become somewhat uh, dilapidated. A uh, Markham is put in there uh, because it's important. Uh, it's where his teacher died, and if you just remember that uh, for that, and the Mount Kawakapo, he that's as far south as he went in this area. Uh, it's a sacred mountain, did a circumambulation pilgrimage uh, there at one time. And here, this is previous incarnation, uh, we haven't got there yet. <laughs> uh, and uh, I'm just giving the geography really so we get the idea of uh, this is all. Huge mountains here. The um, and main rivers of Asia, several of the main rivers of Asia. And then about time near there, just northeast of it, is where he spent many years in retreat as well. So if you just try to, those geographical elements. So there is his dates 1204 to 1283. Sometimes his date is given as 1206. Uh, this I personally go for 1204. Um, the person, the historical writer who gave 1206, um, tended to get his right dates wrong. <laughs> uh, but that was in the 17th century. Um, the, uh, this is an idea of where near where he was uh, born on the up, up, upper banks of the uh, Yangtze River. And uh, by the age of six, he was able to read without being taught, apparently. But it's slightly unusual to be able to read in those times, one would imagine. And very shortly, he was able to read Buddhist scriptures, not the easiest of reading. Uh, and he actually became, he, he would uh, be employed, so to speak, or there would be exchange of goods. Uh, he would go around houses and read scriptures. It was a virtuous activity to have scripture read in your house, and uh, you would then receive food or got off. So he was part of that uh, economy. But by the age of 11, he decided to go to uh, central uh, Tibet to uh, gain some uh, learning. But he didn't get very far. Uh, just south of Chandor, if you remember where Delhi was, and then you start going in towards central Tibet, and then just south of Chandal, uh, he met on a hillside a person called Pondrapa, a teacher uh, of the area. And they, for some reason, you know, he decided to, uh, well, they just met him. And then that evening, uh, Pondrapa gave an initiation. And after the initiation, he called this child to him, the 11-year-old, 
and uh, said, during that initiation, I had several visions of you being surrounded by the figure of this painting, but the figure of Dusan Kemper, who had died quite some years earlier. We're in about 1210 now, uh, sorry, 1215, because he's 11 years old. So he, he died 20 uh, odd years ago. And he said, you must have some karmic connection. Yeah. Didn't use the word karmic, but you, you, you had a karma connection there. Yeah. And he said, uh, stay, can you stay with me? And so Karp actually decided to stay with him and uh, take some uh, teaching on meditation and so forth, so rather than go into uh, central Tibet. So this is a picture of Pondrakpa. Now Pondrakpa, as far as I know, never actually met Dusan Kempa, uh, but he was the disciple of Drogan Rechen, who was the disciple of uh, Dusan Kempa. So you've got a sort of grand, grandson disciple here, saying to Kamapakshi, this child, you are the reincarnation or you have a karmic connection to my sort of grandfather guru in a way. So there's quite a, a distance uh, in terms of well, time anyway. Uh, and I think that this is working. Um, I think that we can say that, well, I would say that this is the first stage of the reincarnation development within Kamapakshi's life. There are three stages, really. we'll see them uh, come up. Uh, and this is the recognition of the karma connection to the predecessor. So Dusum Kempa, he is now called the first Kamapa, but he wasn't, he was never called Kamapa in his lifetime. Uh, Kamapakshi uh, refers to himself as Kam, uh, Kamapa quite a few times. Um, but, uh, and then later on, uh, well, even the third Kamapa was not called Kamapa. Uh, it was only when the fourth came along that it became a sort of institutionalized name. Come on. Uh, but they have retrospectively assigned the name Kamapa to uh, Dusan Kempo. So this is the, the sort of first stage during his life when he was a, a child. Now the teachings he received from Pom Drakpa uh, were on Saraha, uh, his Doha, the Doha of the king, the Doha of the queen, and the Doha of the people, which are basically uh, songs uh, of instruction. Uh, they were really quite popular in, in Tibet. And we also received the, the Mahmudra instruction of Gampopa. So this is in the Kagyu tradition, the oral lineage tradition. Uh, Gampopa, the student of Milarepa, some of you may know Milarepa. And he also received a teaching on the introduction to the three kayas, uh, which does involve a certain amount of yoga as well. Uh, very little, but um, it's mostly a guru yoga. And uh, this was the teaching that later Kamapakshi would use quite a lot. He taught both Kublai Khan and Mongi Khan this teaching. It was very popular. Uh, it was very, he was very keen on it. Uh, and he would give it publicly as well uh, on, on his travels. It was his main uh, teaching. It's, well, it's really only, the only one that he mentions is, you know, I gave this teaching to people. Um, he gave various initiations as well. So a bit later on, roughly when he was 20, 18 or 20, he went for, I don't know the exact date, but he went for ordination and further training, more intellectual training in Katok. Remember where Katok was, it's uh, on the map. Uh, and this is not a Kagyu monastery, it's a Nyingma monastery. So they have connections back to the Tibetan Empire time before the, the rekindling. Uh, and Actually, Kamapakshi was uh, seemed to be fairly uh, easygoing about uh, the the differences between the two. He refers to a Mahamudra and Zogchen as being two different names but the same meaning. Zogchen relates to the Nyingma; it's sort of the ultimate state of the Nyingma, and Mahamudra for the Kagyu. And he's saying that. Uh, they're two different names, but the same meaning. And 
In fact, in one of his uh, longer works, which details hundreds of, refers to hundreds of uh, um, tantras, roughly half of the tantras uh, would be Kagyu, Sama tantras, and half Nyingma tantras. So it doesn't seem to have uh, made much distinction in those terms. He was very much a, a Kagyu uh, later on when he took over the monasteries too. So he spent some time there and then see up in Katok here. And then he, he went back to his teacher in this area and they decided to go down to Marka. And it was because Mongols, they were escaping or avoiding, should we say, uh, an, a Mongol invasion. Now, it's not clear where the Mongols were, the forces, but they may have been coming down the, uh, the east side of Tibet, west China, uh, perhaps trying to get into uh, China uh, further down by going along the, um, where the mountains uh, meet the plain. Anyway, they went down to Markham, and unfortunately, Pom Drakpa, his teacher, then died. And he seems, Kamapakshi, uh, to have been somewhat despondent at this time and a little bit unsure about what to do. Uh, and after a while, uh, he, had, uh, he had several visions at the time, and one of them uh, told him to go uh, east. And much of his life was governed by <laughs> visions. He would have a vision and then tell him to go somewhere and he would uh, do, uh, do so. And he went actually up to near Batang here and found a, a spot uh, just northeast of it. And this purports to be the ruins of the buildings that he initiated when he uh, <laughs> gave his uh, retreat there. And he spent uh, some years there, 11 years there, and the after a while, he began to collect students around, as many as 500 people would uh, hear stories of his miraculous powers, uh, that there was a great yogi living up on the top of the hill. You can see here, it's up on the top here, here's another angle of the uh, ruins there. And this is where well, you see Batang there, and it's actually just up there. <coughs> is over here. Now, while he was in retreat, he had a vision, a dream, sorry, this time it was well, a visionary dream. <laughs> and he, his uh, Dakinis came to him. Dakinis are like female spiritual beings. And they sort of challenged him to say, can you sing the Mani Mantra, the Om Mani Pemi, the, the mantra of Avalokiteshvara, which is the god of compassion, we, or love and compassion, to put it simply, Om Mani Pemi. And so he sang it to them, and they said, no, 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 you're not singing it right. And so they actually sang it to him in a particular tune, and he uh, apparently memorized it, and then would tell people, uh, they told the, the Starkinis, told him that it would be very beneficial for people. And so he, uh, it was a, another one of the things that he uh, spread about. Now it did seem to, and we have references to it in the 16th century, uh, that it was quite widespread amongst communities. Uh, people do uh, communally sing this uh, mantra. And he, uh, but it doesn't, it doesn't seem to have uh, made its way into modern times very well. But I found that there was a, a, a Lama, Lama Nola, Nola who uh, said that he knew the tune. He was quite a good, he had a reputation for being a good chanter. And he, in the 2000s, 2007, I think, eight, uh, six, he uh, sang it and I recorded it. And then uh, our illustrious uh, composer here uh, transcribed it for me. Yeah. And then I asked um, a medieval musician, it's no connection, but he plays it on a 
uh, a Western instrument, but just to give you an idea of the uh, tune. Well, I heard somebody say uncle. That's right. <laughs> so he spent several years uh, in uh, Umri up here. And then after retreat, he decided to leave retreat. He got all his uh, students uh, surrounding him, so to speak, well, uh, engaged with him. Uh, he decided to start going around several of Dusum Kempus monasteries, which had been, this is when they were founded. So it's quite a long time, uh, it's a hundred years later that he starts, well, 80 years in some cases, but um, he starts uh, 120, sorry, or 80, uh, starts going around and repairing. So it, it's almost as though he's taking on the responsibility of the uh, what Dusan Kempa had established in his lifetime. And in monasteries were... Uh, which we say um, ravaged uh, during the great cultural revolution, and they've since been uh, restored. But that gives you an idea of uh, what they uh, might have looked like uh, back in back in the day. Uh, but and he did do quite a lot of restoring monasteries. He didn't necessarily make new monasteries very much. He did a few, uh, but he was quite keen on uh, restoring uh, buildings. And also, when he did his travels uh, um, further into Mongolian areas, uh, quite a few uh, Buddhist thing, uh, structures had been uh, damaged as well, and he would repair them too. So while he was at uh, Karma Gurn here, which, if you remember, was sort of north-westish a bit of the earlier map, Two young monks from the Shangshung area in West Tibet came to him and asked him to come to Surpu, which was the main monastery that Dusan Kempa had established in central Tibet near Lhasa. Uh, he'd established it in 1189 and then he died in uh, 1193. And he agreed. So it's even further taking over the mantle of the monastery. Now here we have a, a picture before uh, destruction in the 60s uh, by Hugh Richardson. And uh, the, it's not necessarily the size that it might have been uh, in Karl Pakshi's day, but it gives you some idea of uh, the, the building. And, and actually, as we'll see later, uh, Karl Pakshi built a, st uh, a statue that was 60 feet high. That's six stories high. So, and it indoors. So it, it must have been quite a tall building already, or perhaps he extended it to make it tall. So his, when he got to Tsurpu, he actually found it somewhat dilapidated. It'd been quite a while uh, since he, uh, since Dusan Kempa had died. And not only that, but the, the Sangha had become somewhat loose. They'd started drinking. And so he, both revived the buildings and the Sangha, and he was there for about six years. Meanwhile, over in 
China, West China, Kublai Khan, North West China, Kublai Khan had decided to lead an expedition down the east side of Tibet, down into the Dali Kingdom. And it, it was quite a rapid expedition because he didn't meet much resistance. He got down to Dali, uh, the king, the local ruler, uh, immediately, well, almost immediately uh, surrendered. And then Kamapakshi started going back up to his homeland. Uh, sorry, not Kamapakshi. Uh, Kublai Khan started going back up to his uh, homeland. So in the journey down and up, somewhere along the way, he heard about this um, unusual, miraculous uh, yogi. And he issued, he sent a, a messenger right across into uh, central Tibet who managed to find Kamapakshi uh, and invited him to come to his court. Kublai Khan was not emperor then. He was the eldest brother of the ruling emperor at the time, who was Mongi Khan. Uh, and well, the, yeah, the eldest brother, yes, he was the second brother. And uh, when they met, the messengers got to uh, Tsopu and you know, invited him, uh, Kamap actually had severe doubts about going. Remember, he'd, he'd run away, so to speak, from the Mongols earlier in East Tibet. Uh, and so, should I go? Should I not? And he actually writes in his biography. And then, of course, he has a vision. <laughs> and it tells him that if he does go, it will be uh, beneficial. So, he decides to go, and you can imagine what the local Sangha must have thought. He'd, you know, he'd come, he'd started to revive the monastery. Um, it, was, it was quite a thing to have this um, very adept um, uh, meditator and teacher uh, with them, and then he suddenly decides to go. Anyway, he did make his way, and he met uh, Kublai Khan. I think up in uh, northwest uh, Tibet, uh, sort of uh, western China, not in Tibet, but uh, just beyond there. Um, and he was well received in the court initially, and he gave uh, Kublai Khan some instruction on the uh, Bodhisattva vow, Bodhisattva uh, Bodhicitta, should we say, instruction, uh, and things really went quite well to start with. But he had a Kamapakshi had a premonition that there was going to be trouble at the court at some point, there would be some degree of conflict. So he decided to leave, uh, which was quite a unusual move, shall we say, and it didn't, it, it upset Kublai Khan quite a bit, as we'll see later, he sort of retaliated. And uh, he continued to spend time in that area up here. He established a, a monastery. It was built, apparently the building was built in 108 days, uh, somewhat miraculously. Uh, and he gave teachings uh, and the, he actually, yes, he does mention a wall as well. So he must have uh, presumably seen uh, the, one of the um, great China walls. And then uh, he was near a place called Tsongkha, which coincidentally is where the uh, the current Dalai Lama was born, and he received messengers from Mongi Khan, who's up in Karakoram. He's the Khan of Khans. Mongi Khan had been way over. He'd been in uh, Kiev at one time. He'd been right over, uh, probably as far as Hungary. Uh, so he was he was quite a warrior, uh, but he was now the uh, emperor, so to speak, of the Mongolian emperor and the chief amongst the Khans. And uh, he'd issued this invitation to Kamapakshi to come and visit him. Kamapakshi had no doubts this time, or he doesn't express in his memoirs anyway. Uh, so he proceeded to cross the desert here and approached uh, Karakoram. And he uh, met uh, Mongi Khan uh, near Karakoram. Now, as he was approaching Karakoram, there's the second stage of, as I would put it, uh, the reincarnation development within his lifetime. And what happened was that Dusun Kemper, 
prior incarnation, had spoken Dusum Kempa means knower of the three times. So he had a reputation for knowing uh, the past, the present, and the future. And he had a reputation for telling about his past lives as well. And he'd spoken to disciples about this, in, you know, different disciples, and there are at least uh, three accounts of him speaking about this. And at one point, as disciples would, they would say, well, when you're going to die, where are you going to be reborn? They want to know when it's going to be reborn. So he gave, not entirely um, precisely, but he gave some examples. He gave three examples of where he would be reborn, one down in India, one in the West. And the third one was, I will be reborn for the sake of one person, which is very unusual for you've got the Buddhist idea that you if you're going to influence your next birth, then you would, uh, well, all your Buddhist practice is in order to help enlighten all beings. So to say that you are going to be reincarnated in order to help one being seems contradictory. And the other incarnations obviously weren't Kamapakshi. So it, you can imagine this was a bit of a puzzle. Why? You know, he said this, and yet it hasn't happened. Well, as he approached Karakor, it was then that he realized, and I presume a little bit, that uh, he saw the uh, sort of splendid nature of uh, Mongi Khan's court. He realized that, oh, I was actually Mongi Khan that I have been reborn for, so to speak. Because if you can convert an emperor, then it has a huge influence over many other people. That is the uh, intimation that he had as he approached uh, Karagora. So his meeting with uh, Mongi Khan was, uh, well, it was a bit unusual to start with, but it was harmonious. Uh, there was a bit of thunder and lightning, and everybody uh, sort of thinks, oh, what's going on? And uh, he, he got a, uh, he's just crossed the desert, you know, more or less. Well, we don't know how many people with him, but not many. Um, and he gets an audience with this grand emperor. And once, I'll read from the book here, page uh, 63. Once Kamapakshi had gained his first audience with the earth protector king, the emperor commanded, I am the ruler of the world. Get rid of my obstacles. <laughs> Kamapakshi replied, tonight I'll think about it a bit. It's a somewhat brave reply to make in front of a warrior emperor. In the morning of the next day, Kamapakshi again had access to Emperor Mongi and gave his recommendations as recounted in verse. Indeed, in this imperfect world, never will there be a king like you, whatever any astrologers have said. I myself, Kamapakshi, seek to counteract your obstacles, benefit the Buddha's teaching and all beings, distribute food, food and wealth throughout the kingdom, repair the residences of the lamas, and make sky offerings with no sense of loss. Again and again, I ask you to set free the prisoners kept in the prisons. So the, he made several sort of social policy requests uh, of Mongi Khan. And according to Kamapakshi, anyway, Mongi Khan took them up. He actually gave from the treasury, uh, distributed uh, food and wealth. He did repair uh, monasteries. He actually helped in the establishment of a monastery, uh, of a temple, sorry, in uh, Karakoram. Uh, make bountiful sky offerings that it's the Tibetan reference to uh, broken uh, tradition. And he set, uh, Mongi Khan set three prisoners as many as 13 times. Uh, it may not necessarily be criminals, it may have been uh, uh, hostages from war as well. But he, he uh, actually claims that uh, he followed all of these things. He also uh, 
prohibited uh, cattle slaughter and hunting uh, on certain days of the month, the 8th, the 10th, the 15th, and the uh, 23rd. Uh, this we actually, so it would seem that that indicates that Camelot actually had some vegetarian leanings, perhaps, I don't know. But you can imagine getting a Mongolian court to not hunt and uh, slaughter four days a month. Uh, and there is some uh, ev external evidence, apart from Camelot, actually, uh, of this. Uh, but um, uh, Cleves, uh, Francis Cleves, uh, found this. Although he was writing about an inscription in 1240, uh, towards the end of the article, uh, he refers here to um, so secret if they are a judge you know, to that they, should, they shouldn't uh, kill as well. There we go, the 8th, 15th, and 20th, the first day, uh, slightly different. And the um, uh, Munkiev as well, a few years later, um, included it, uh, re referred to this inscription. Uh, the Mong Mongis court, court, well, not of course, but it had Europeans as well. A famous William uh, Boucher Parisian jeweler made the, this is just, uh, in a, there's no example of it, uh, but this is somebody's imagination in the 18th century. Uh, but this, many people talked about it, the, uh, uh, wrote about it, the, uh, a fountain that had four. Well, he's a, a distributor of alcohol. Uh, refers at one point to uh, being in the court uh, with uh, Mongi and Adekpoki, who was the youngest man. Okay. The, and uh, they were drinking, and Kamapakshi was uh, invited to join in. And uh, he says that he uh, drank, and he drank them dry. I drank the whole court dry. Um, so maybe it was one of these, I, I don't I'm conjecturing here, uh, maybe one of the fountain uh, things that he drank dry. He said that uh, it didn't affect him at all. It was like water into water. And he then proceeded to, they all thought this was slightly miraculous that uh, he wasn't um, very drunk. And uh, he then gave the uh, Chakra Savara uh, initiation to the uh, Mongol court. And he also gave Mahmudra instruction to Mongi. Apparently, he was a good meditator, according to Karma Bakshi, um, and several other initiations and instructions. It's detailed in the, in the book. Uh, but of course, Mongi is still a warrior, even though he's Gabbling, shall we say, uh, with this Buddhist uh, teacher. And he was uh, setting in motion the idea of conquering China. His grandfather, Chinggis Khan, had attempted it, had died in the attempt in 1227. So now we're into uh, 1257, 30 years later, Monga is gathering forces uh, to go south. Kamapakshi decides to leave and he goes across to the uh, Chagatai uh, capital over at Almanac uh, to see the Khan there. Uh, it was in, uh, it was a regency, really. It was the mother that was more in charge. Uh, and they were more interested in Islam, actually. So he doesn't mention much of what goes on there. And it, he doesn't seem to have had much success. He didn't, uh, as a teacher, yeah, he didn't stay very long. And then he proceeded, he went to possibly Kucha, possibly uh, Turfan. Uh, I think I personally think it's the Kucha more. And uh, he spent eight months there, began writing there as well. And while he was there, he had an important dream, important for him anyway, that a, a huge Buddha spoke to him and said, you must build a statue the same size as me. This is the 60-foot uh, statue that he built. And it seemed to have affected him quite strongly uh, because several, I mean, many years later, when he eventually got back to Tsukhu, he actually uh, set about doing this, even though he was quite old by then. So he proceeded uh, along Silk 
uh, route, and then he met up with uh, Mongi Khan in the Liu Kanchang, excuse my pronunciation, um, mountains again, uh, and again a harmonious uh, meeting, and he asked uh, that he could leave uh, to go to Tibet. Uh, by now he'd been given uh, quite a lot of silver by Mongi, and he must have got quite a big uh, sort of entourage of just for the animals to carry it, I suppose. Uh, and he wanted to go and use it uh, in the monasteries in his homeland and in central Tibet to make them even grander, I suppose. And uh, Mongi was uh, quite willing to let him go, you know, he was engaged in uh, about to start uh, fighting a lot. Uh, and they parted, and Karl Pachi spent uh, some time in this area, again, preaching and so forth. Uh, and in meanwhile, Mongi went further south, and he uh, died in 1259, in summer, uh, from a disease. So being reincarnated for the sake of one person didn't, um, unfortunately, lead to much effect in terms of the influence uh, with Mongi. But it may have planted the seeds uh, later for the way that uh, Mongolia went with the religion. But anyway, after Mongi died, there was competition between the youngest brother, Arik Burke, up in Karakoram, and Kublai Khan here in northern China. And something of a civil war started for, in 1260. And because Karmapakshi had been up in Karakoram, been popular at the court of Mongi and Arik Boke, Kublai Khan took up against him. He thought, for some reason, that you know, he was on the side of Arik Boke. And also, there was the fact that he'd left and annoyed him very greatly, something like 10 years earlier. Well, not 10, five years earlier. So he had him, well, he had him arrested and attempted to have him killed. And for some reason, uh, I mean, it becomes uh, quite legendary, but he, uh, he escaped being killed. He kept on being, they would try various different ways of killing him. And each time it didn't work. To the extent that eventually the executioner committed suicide. He was so upset. Um, and so Kublai Khan decided to uh, punish him or restrict him, shall we say, by sending him into what internal exile up here. And it could be uh, on this coastline here. It's certainly on the edge of a either a lake or a sea. It's hard to tell. Um, and there are islands, and there are some islands here. But uh, there is a. He does mention. Common fact, he does mention quite specifically that. It's a very barren area. So there is a, a big lake up near uh, Shangdu and Zandu, and the, um, uh, the Dalai Noor, which is a, a very, here's a picture of uh, Zandu, well, a drone picture. Oh, it is. Um, surrounding the lake is volcanic rock, and it, it's very uh, barren and desolate. So he spent there. In this area, and spent some time on an island yeah. there as well. Uh, and no trees, he said, as well. So, I mean, this is a modern bit. It does seem to be uh, quite barren. Um, the, he spent uh, two years there, but he didn't waste his time. He did quite a bit of writing. Well, a bit more than two years. By the time the Civil War was over, then come Kublai Khan, then had him released, and he came. Oops, I don't know what uh, He came down near well, what was eventually built as uh, Beijing. Beijing. There were uh, buildings there, but the, what we know as Beijing hadn't been built. It was near Beijing, so south west of it. Um, and he had him imprisoned there in a temple, uh, and the doors bolted, uh, nails in the doors put a guard on in, in shifts. This is actually detailed. And then, but he still managed to get out. Uh, and uh, he was then brought 
before Kublai Khan, and because of this somewhat miraculous uh, event, the uh, Kublai Khan then completely relented and asked him to be his teacher. It looks like Kamap actually had had enough <laughs> because he said, no, thanks. <laughs> I want to go home. Uh, and Kublai Khan, again, you know, change of heart, he said, please do go. And wherever you go, pray for me. So it was like a complete change of um, heart there after all this trouble. Earlier. So Kamap actually set off uh, and it took him quite a while, uh, you know, doing a sort of missionary tour, should we say, came down to uh, Dege uh, area, uh, helped some of the monasteries here, built statues. He's quite a wealthy man by now. Goes back to uh, Tsopo and starts to build this 60 foot uh, statue, which technically must have been quite difficult area. Uh, it got destroyed in the Cultural Revolution. Unfortunately. Richardson saw it, but he didn't photograph it. 1240s. So then we get to the really the third stage of the reincarnation points uh, in his lifetime, and it's the preparation for both the child that oops, the child that's to come, so to speak, and the continuity of the lineage of the teaching. So aside from building this statue, when the statue got built. It almost immediately, one would assume, became quite well known. Where, where are you going to find in the medieval world 60 foot metal statue? Uh, those ones in uh, China, uh, not China, uh, Japan, uh, uh, they're about half the height, but they still exist. This is 60 feet. The, um, so uh, it fairly quickly seems to have become a pilgrimage. He would go and see it. Now, a party from southern Tibet, near the, the north side of the Himalayas, came on pilgrimage, and amongst them was a potter and his wife, an a itinerant potter. And they came and they wished to see the statue, gain blessings, and so forth, from the teacher. And at one point, Kamap actually called aside this potter. Uh, it actually mentions, you know, on the path uh, outside of the circle. So it really was quite a sign. And he said to him, I'd like to ask you to loan me your house sometime. And the potter thought, this is very strange. You know, this great teacher coming to me and said, what's the borrow of house? So he went back to his party. And said to them, this great teacher is asked to borrow my house. And they burst out laughing because he's an itinerant potter. He has no house. So it was a great puzzle. And actually, uh, the next year, a child was born to his wife, the potter's wife. And that was the child that uh, the person who was looking for the next incarnation uh, said that it was the next incarnation. So it seems that he was setting it up in a way. Either he knew that she was pregnant or that uh, he was you know, intimating that she would become pregnant in that way. Uh, the other, the teacher who found the, the next child is, uh, was Ogyempa. And he uh, spent, he came, he was a great yogi, he came to visit uh, Kamapakshi and uh, he spent just three days there and he received uh, transmission, what they call the mind to mind transmission. And uh, he was taught the, uh, the tune, the Mani tune that we heard, and also uh, received a Avalokiteshvara uh, initiation as well. And during that, this mind to mind. Uh, <clears throat> Transmission, which would help preserve the tradition as a gentleman. Uh, a little while later, Kamak actually seems to have had a stroke. He couldn't talk, uh, he had to be helped. Uh, and then he recovered somewhat, as far as we can tell. Um, and 
then eventually he died in In so the next Karmapa is actually, there is a book about him uh, in the same series, you can see the same kind of design, and I think she's talking, Ruth Gamble is talking in London, oh, no it's on Zoom, she's in Australia, but with the shang either later this month or next month, I think it's later this month, so you might wish to uh, catch that. Uh, she has translated, she found and translated, well, it was in plain sight, uh, she uh, brought it to attention. The, um, um, the third Karmapa's writing about his transition in the intermediary period between death and his next life. So it's quite interesting. <laughs> it's quite unusual. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah. Surprised that not more has been made of it yet. But anyway, uh, that's quite interesting. Uh, so, in the book, in uh, this book about the second Kamapa, uh, you'll see the various uh, chapters. Uh, what he is talking about his previous incarnations, about meditation, uh, some examples of his uh, verse and his prose, uh, his conversations with Manjusri, like a vision, his reflections on Tantra. His uh, musings on consecration, he was very keen on consecration and gave, uh, he gives reasons uh, why it's important as well. Um, and then a song, a verse, poem about uh, for a disciple. Um, an account of his deathbed song, not by him, of course, but uh, um, actually it comes uh, from much later, but I included it because it's, it's quite uh, useful. And an account of his uh, his verse autobiography. Uh, we don't have the original, but it's contained within a later history. So I thought that that would be worthwhile. Um, his own autobiography written in, in verse. And this is an example. This is the um, the memoirs manuscript that I mostly worked from on this. Uh, you can see it's. Uh, yeah, but this is where it now is. Uh, you can't get access to it. There's political difficulties, uh, and uh, but it was uh, sort of copied in, in uh, 1978 and uh, been issued and it's been available as a copy. But the actual manuscript, this black here, uh, is the black part of the text, and then the uh, the writing, which comes out white here, is actually in silver. Found somebody who'd seen it uh, before he started and uh, said it was in silver. And it's in three main parts. Uh, there, uh, some in verse, uh, the part A has uh, several sections as well. Uh, each part has certain characters uh, illustrated. And uh, yeah, it's it's a bit. I call it memoir rather than autobiography because it ran, it goes around quite a bit. It's not like a, a linear uh, description, so it's quite complicated. Uh, I also uh, found in twenty ten uh, a text which has uh, it's not directly by him, but apparently he spoke about his previous incarnations. He does in his memoirs as well, but not so much in here. Uh, there's qu uh, quite a few previous incarnations talked about. Um, and this we heard on this page here, it says, we heard this from the precious Lord Jetson's mouth. So the person who wrote it um, apparently heard it directly from him. It's a report, basically. Um, and uh, yes, uh, Gelson, someone just quote from there. Um, I found this uh, in. Uh, Harpoon Monastery, um, actually was in a kitchen. <laughs> There's a bridge. Um, I was, uh, it was Alarm's kitchen, and I, uh, I was sleeping in the kitchen. Um, and I thought, oh, I'll have a look through those books. <laughs> and there it was. It was part of, yeah, it's, it's quite short. It was part of this. So that was quite uh, fortunate. Uh, yeah, that's uh, just the details there. 
uh, he was a student of the third come up that the, the wrote, but apparently he knew the um, second claims to have heard it directly from it. Another uh, work that was quite useful and I'm currently working on as well is uh, the songs of Colonel Pekshi, which I didn't know about at all. Um, and in the process of writing and publication and so forth, uh, we had the pandemic, so everything sort of slows down, goes on hold. And I was tooting around the internet as you do. And I found that actually uh, in Oxford, they have uh, a reproduction of this. It's a reproduction from 2015. <clears throat> uh, the, the original is somewhere either in Chengdu or near Chengdu. And I'd never heard of this before. And so I was able to include perhaps a dozen of the poems in the, in the book. So in a way, it was quite fortuitous, the uh, delay. And uh, they're not, yeah. He doesn't, um, oh, there, there's uh, where it's, it's uh, Souls and Library. Uh, here, not this building, uh, here, where it is. It was quite uh, fortuitous. They're known as uh, Vajra songs, and uh, it's uh, 59 songs, uh, and the, they often refer, they don't refer to Kamapakshi so much as the Lama of Tsopal. It is uh, Kamapakshi. Um, and uh, it makes quite a lot of references to Saraha, uh, the 8th century yogin. You remember that's uh, who we see teaching. Uh, they don't necessarily say where the songs were sung or created, unfortunately. So I've introduced them into the book. Um, if they're talking about something that seems to relate to a particular subject or a place, then I put them in there. They have taken a bit of license there to associate particular songs. I hope to uh, get them all translated when they get through. So the complete works of Karma Pakshi, at the moment we have something like 40 of them. I'm not going to go into much detail here. But what he's famous for is this series, Limitless Ocean. Jamsa Pai uh, series of works. Uh, 19, half of them are part of this series. And it was quite structured. You can see very early on, he's talking about uh, uh, this Jamsa Pai, this limitless ocean, that limitless ocean, deriving from there. This is quite early on. So it wasn't so much that he just wrote a load of books and, and include limitless ocean in the title. Uh, he actually got it sort of planned out from very early on. And uh, there's some examples of uh, what the, this uh, limitless ocean uh, are, the limitless ocean of teaching, of the excellence, and so forth, like that, just to give you um, an idea there. And uh, for uh, further of them there, extracting the essence, the limitless ocean of extracting the essence. Uh, the liberal association derived from above with instructions on the subtle winds, prana. And uh, this is the one where he had a debate with uh, Manjusri in a vision, eliminating the 21 wrong views. It turns out to be 24, actually. But, uh, uh, and I give the questions, I, I don't give all the answers, it's a very long text in the, in the book as well of this uh, debate. And then, of course, the limitless association of realization, the fruition of all. All these uh, books. So that's how his work, he structured it. So, and then we come into more modern times. Uh, there are two main Perma traditions that found treasures, as some of you will know the word Terma, uh, that are quite important for even nowadays for Buddhist practitioners. In the 17th century, there was uh, Yong E Ming Girl Rinpoche, some of you will know. There's a Yong Emin Rinpoche, currently, he's going to be in Edinburgh in June. Um, the, he's become very well known as a good teacher now. But the first Yong Emin Rinpoche had a vision of uh, Kamapakshi and the instruction and then the, the whole uh, practice involved with it has become a core practice for the Kagyu tradition. And in fact, when the uh, 16th Kamapa uh, arrived in, uh, this is the author, <laughs> um, the, uh, the uh, arrived in the West in the 70s, 
uh, everywhere he went, he said, do the Karmapakshi practice. But it was particularly um, useful for Westerners. Uh, so that derives from the 17th century. Um, and it's a, sort of come up a, a guru. And then in 1968, uh, the famous uh, Chugam Trumpa Rinpoche, uh, he was in Bhutan and uh, he had a vision and out of this came a practice of the sadhana of Mahamudra. And this is what the Shambhala um, uh, organization that he founded. Uh, but it's apparently it's, it, they don't use it nearly as much nowadays. Um, but they did use it, but I don't know much about it. It's different to the, this publisher of Shambhala, and there's a group which is they're different entities. Uh, it's the same name, a bit like Zotchen. Uh, 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 and that was in 1968. He had it translated, came back to Scotland. People started practicing, and he went to America and they uh, started practicing as well. So that's derived from uh, a vision of Karma Pakistan as well. So there's uh, uh, Yogi Mingyo. So this is in 2022. He's still, you know, he's giving the initiations of it, of the Karma Pakistan uh, practice. Uh, it's been translated into Chinese, and uh, that's a, a tanker of what's involved in the meditation for it. See, he's got the beard there. That's the beard. Yeah, it's the only come up with it. Had. Well, no come up after him had a beard. Um, apparently, we <laughs> don't have photographs, but uh, from the paintings. And this is the uh, 1968. Well. This isn't it. This is what was printed later. They uh, take I think. Uh, the uh, sadhana of Mahamudra. And there's the visualization uh, there, uh, derived from vision. So there we have it. Uh, he had you know, a life of 70 odd years met two emperors, gave some Buddhist instruction to both of them, but, well, I suppose Kublai Khan later, he also, Kublai Khan also had instruction from Pakpa to Tibetan, um, and perhaps paid more attention to him later on. Um, I think it seems like in the early days when they were, it was harmonious between them, when they first met, that it was Kublai Khan that was, Really interested in common action, and that it was Chubby, his wife, who was more interested in uh, Papa, the younger teacher. But it's hard to tell. Um, the, and there is also the, so the whole, you've got from the 13th century right up until modern times, for 800 years, this tradition has continued. So there have been 17 uh, Kamapas uh, now. Uh, if you look at the popes, there's been over 2,000 years, there's been 200 odd. So, But they, you know, they wait for somebody to die and then they elect somebody inspired by prayers and so forth. They, they elect somebody, but it's always an old person. So you're going to get much more, much quicker repetition, so to speak. If you're looking at continuity of the tradition with the Kamapas and then the, all the other uh, reincarnations of the tradition, uh, it goes to a child. And so when it was a child after Kamapakshi, that was the first time that it was actually a very young child. Mm -hmm. he, it wasn't really a thought of as being reincarnation until he was 11. And it's really, I think, by the time of the fourth Kamapa that it you know, it's like beginning to really get established. And it spread, the idea spread right across the uh, Tibet and eventually up into Mongolia as well. Um, this idea of uh, transferring authority, both of the monastery and the teaching to a child and then bringing up the child and uh, then uh, assuming uh, the full authority usually when they're about 16 or so. So he was very influential on that. Um, and also this fact that he was both Nyingma and Kagyu, so to speak, uh, that was quite 
it was then alleged later that he was very influential. He was a source of inspiration, shall we say, to the Rime movement of the 19th century, um, because they were looking back to Kamak Chakmi of the uh, 16th century, and uh, he had written that Kamapakshi was an inspiration to him, that the, the fact of being non-sectarian. Um, uh, so perhaps he had some influence in that way at a, at a great uh, distance as well. And of course, these two practices, which nowadays all around, uh, I don't want to give an impression of huge numbers, but uh, there are Buddhist, Kagyu Buddhist centers around North America, Europe, Australia, South America, Russia. You know, it's, it has extraordinary spreading from him coming in the 70s. Um, the, uh, and this all derives from Kamapakshi. So it's quite an important um, person from that point, from this particular phenomenon of the reincarnated lamas. Um, because after him, uh, 1642, we always seem to get these 42 dates, then, 1842, 1642. Um, the, uh, that's when the fifth Dalai Lama uh, becomes the sort of governor of Tibet 400 years later. And then they, began, they ruled in Tibet for 300 years. That, that whole idea of reincarnation uh, starts, reincarnated lamas uh, taking over authority uh, starts with um, compassion. I think my voice is going dry and I'd better stop oh, there. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much for this um, uh, inspiring and <laughs> Quite exhausting in both uh, senses, um, uh, also because you had to speak against the um, the, the was part of the population, but uh, they they're just next door. But uh, in any case, um, uh, I have um, questions almost for every slide. But uh, I I think uh, uh, I, I first pass the word to uh, the the audience. So if uh, if you have uh, specific questions, uh, ask. Please. Maybe we can collect, but. Where to go first? I don't have a question, but I did look up the date that lecture you referred to is this Saturday night. Ah, which uh, Ruth Gamble? Yes. Oh right. gosh, is that soon? Yeah. yeah. Great. Right. So you can jump to third comma in, in a week. <laughs> yes. Great. It's online. What's the statue of in Sorpo? Oh, there? I'm sorry. It was a Buddha. Yes. Which one? Uh, you know? uh, Sakyamuni Buddha? Yes. He, uh, in the dream, he sees this huge Buddha, golden Buddha, speaks to him uh, and uh, says, build something like me. <laughs> yes. You think of the complications of doing it. You think of the word so is if you look at the value of mind or something. Um, they had to get metal, the ore, they had to get to a certain temperature, you need coal or charcoal, and then to actually have that controlled to build something that big is really quite something. It gives a little bit of comparison to the Eiffel Tower, a little bit, just to give an idea of not the Eiffel Tower, sorry, the um, Statue of Liberty. Do you know <laughs> who were the workmen? No. I was, uh, well, we don't know exactly. Um, but I suspect it may have been Nepalese, Nepalese experts, yeah. Yeah. and it may well have been Repousse rather than Cars, not sure. Um, people, uh, I've been told since that uh, people have various bits of it that was exploded mm. uh, and destroyed, and they keep it as relics. Um, so I'd like to see, you could probably tell um, how it was made from that, um, but that would be quite interesting. The, the one they've then replaced now, a smaller one, but the, the things got better again. And the, um, that's about 40 feet high. And I actually heard it being made. <laughs> and that was done by Riverset. It, it's like really loud. <laughs> but um, I didn't see it finished. You mean you have a 
technically speaking, it's a it's a slab of iron that's been hammered into shape. Yes, yeah, yes. Uh, sheet sheet metal, yes. uh -huh. and then uh, it gets hammered. Yeah, uh -huh. the, the technique technical ability must be fantastic. Yes. We keep control over that size. Um, some of the workers there was disputes. There were a lot of, of course, some obstacles. Um, and apparently the disputes even spread into the kitchens. That's what um, so he said he does refer to the obstacles and then eventually the it was very, very, very this whole area. Yeah. Um, I'm interested in um, two concepts you just not used. One is a debating in here. Um, I'm just wondering why you use uh, the term empire instead of kingdom. Yeah, well, it started in the Yalong area, the sort of south east of uh, Tibet, of Lhasa. Mm -hmm. And if you've got one kingdom there, and then they start taking over other kingdoms, mm -hmm. that's how we think of uh, uh, as an empire. They start to take over, it's a, a unity of several different kingdoms. So uh, this uh, it is uh, uh, an empire, uh, yes. and you also use another term uh, East Tibet. Yes. Uh, but but uh, as a traditional name, we call that area Kams, you know, Kams. Yes, yes, Kams. Uh, yes. K H A M S yes. instead no, of East, no, yes. uh, East Tibet because uh, it is used in the it was used in the modern times. Yes. Uh, mainly by Westerners. Yes. Yes. Yes, I would agree. I would have used Kam. But uh, people don't necessarily know the geography of, uh, and so I think East Tibet is quite reasonable. It's easier. To yes, understand. yes. But there's, there's Calm and there's Amdal as well. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Our speaker comes from Chengdu, by the way. Oh, oh sorry, sorry. Just not uh, so far away from uh, yes. uh, some research about Oh, so really? Just, yeah. Oh, uh, it's an interesting place. Yes. Very yes, interesting. Yes. Yes, yes. Well, next time you might find something. <laughs> it's quite a climb up. Uh, and also, yes, yes. Uh, name of place, um, Padok, uh, K A T O K. Yes. Uh, I don't know what is Chinese name for this place. Chinese. Uh, yeah. uh, uh, I noticed just now just between Gurgur and yes. Yes, it is. It's about halfway between. Uh, so we, we call it Okay. Yeah, there's quite a few monasteries down there uh, where the river goes down uh, between Dege and uh, Batam. Yes. And it is also called Quibis. Oh, like Chinese. The catalog is the yeah. yeah. question to the language. So, uh, when, when you read it, um, it, how much has it changed compared to today? Well, today I was working on uh, in the British Library. Yeah. I've been looking at some manuscripts. Mm -hmm. And I get a bit blasé. <laughs> mm -hmm. Don't tell anybody. But mm -hmm. I mean, I'm careful, of course. But these are Dunhuang material. Yeah. Yeah. And so everything there is more than a thousand years old. So you're just reading it. Why couldn't you write clearer? You know. Um, and the. But that that's written there is the same, very much the same. I can read it. I, I haven't done any special study of you know ancient Tibetan or anything. It's just modern Tibetan, and you can read it. It's, it, it's more or less the same. It's not exactly the same. Uh, modern modern Tibetan has changed a little yeah. bit yeah. Uh, in, since 1959 for obvious reasons. But the um, before that, you can read 19th century. You can read 12th century. It's very easy. You try doing that in English. You can't read. Yeah, no, that, that's what I you know, Shakespeare is hard. Yeah. You go back to Chaucer, yeah. it's impossible yeah. unless you train. Yeah. But this, you just get the training. 
I would take students from so and sometimes up to the British Library at one point and, and um, show them manuscripts there. And they, were, they would marvel at the fact that they could read something from the um, ninth century and it would just, it would read uh, the same, not just the letters, but also the meaning as well. And the grammar is the same, more or less. The spelling is, there are slight variations, but nothing that's complicated. Very fortunate, quite conservative, just being preserved in that way, um, rather than, well, they were quite isolated, you see. There's not this thing of other cultures coming in and changing language that we've had in Europe, for instance. Um, my question is about how do they express? I mean, um, the leader of uh, Tibetan at that time, how do they express their uh, diplomacy relationship with, uh, I think it's Yuan Dynasty or the Mongol Empire? How, how do they express it? Because I think um, he's the official teacher of the Khan of Mongolia, uh, but uh, that kind of special diplomatic relationship or just a, a part of the whole uh, Mongolia empire? Or... Yeah, I'm not quite sure of the question, but the... Um, did, he, did he act as an, as an ambassador, more or less, of, of Tibet? Or not in a little formal that? sense, no, because there was no formal government of Tibet. That, um, that came with Pakpa a little bit, and that was instigated by Kublai Khan. Pakpa, you there's a whole, there is a, a thesis on the fact that I've done in Australia, if you might find it interesting, you can find it online. The, um, and how uh, Kublai Khan, when he became emperor, see, most of the time, oh, he became emperor in 1264. Yes, emperor, I'd call it, 1264. But the Yuan dynasty wasn't really started till later because he hadn't unified China yet. He hadn't conquered China yet. They had the north part, but not the south. It took a huge effort, another 20 odd years or so, um, to uh, get it unified, yeah, to complete to lead the song, the southern song. Um, and the, uh, yeah, so, and in Tibet, it wasn't, there was no formal government in that way. They were just beginning, they had 200 years of developing these monasteries on the way, but there, were, there wasn't, uh, and there were satellite monasteries, like the main one in Circle. And then you know, the ones in the East Bed, that was slightly unusual in itself. Um, and, but it became part of the, the pattern for uh, Tibet. It didn't really, uh, it wasn't until the next century that you could begin to say that there was a particular leader. Pagpa was posited as the leader. He was appointed by Kublai Khan, but it would be hard, it's difficult to know entirely but it would be hard to say that he was a real you know, government leader. It's not really until, uh, somebody may disagree, but until the 17th century with the fifth Dalai Lama, did you get a more unified um, idea of uh, Tibet, sort of overall government? Yes, please. Uh, Marco Polo, did you meet? Is it a kind of actual leader? It does, you will find it on the internet. <laughs> that great bastion of truth. <laughs> but um, uh, no, he, uh, that actually Richardson pointed this out back in the 50s or 60s that the dates don't, the Khan actually left and Marco Polo arrived. Now, it's possibly, possibly uh, that his Marco Polo's father and uncle may have uh, seen of him and that. They reported to Marco Polo. But Marco Polo does mention uh, Tibetan lamas at the court of uh, Kublai Khan performing miracles. Um, so and then people assumed, oh, that's kind of action. But actually, when you look into the dates, uh, it, there's quite a, dis a discrepancy. It's not possible. He also just missed, so to speak, historically, a uh, um, rubric uh, of the we call him Belgian, really, French maybe. Um, he'd been sent by the Pope, European uh, monk as well, 
at Franciscan Monk, and he'd been sent to uh, Karakoro and spent some time with Monge, rather unsuccessfully. Um, and he wrote an account as well, and you can read that. Um, and then he, uh, but he left just two years before Trump actually arrived. So unfortunately, there wasn't a, a meeting there. Just a, a commentary on one of the places that you refer to, Markham. Sounds quite English. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's in Prostitute. <laughs> no, no, it's uh, Markham. Yeah, uh, Mark means a lower, and Cam is Cam. Oh, so it's Lower Cam. It's it's a town in Lower Cam. That's what. Uh, that's you're not the first person who's pointed that out. <laughs> <laughs> It always has to be an English person. <laughs> oh, it's English. <laughs> no, I haven't invented it. For the first time, I, I learned that Mount Kong means Lower Kong. Because yes. I was part of for a long time. <laughs> because, yeah, there's some uh, um, pretty people who travel in that area are really about this, but I just don't know the why. Why do you call that area Lower Kong? Yes. So here. Yes. <laughs> Okay. Yes, the Tibetan names they often have meaning. Dege is a community of virtue. Mm -hmm. um, so at some point it must have um, got this name. How? Oh. Accessible are the original. I mean, what what would you describe as the earliest uh, extant um, manuscripts or writings that are complete of compaction? Yes. Ah. Oh. So, how, what I mean is this reconstructed from no. uh, parts, or is this no. all in? Yes. Is um. Oh, I see. Mm. They're not the. In his original hand, there's not manuscripts in that way. It's you know transcribed copies. Yes. Of copies. Yeah. Um, and how far did they go back to the first extant? Is there mm -hmm. some codex which, like the original? Yeah, I think this memoirs is probably the oldest. Uh -huh. but, uh, it hasn't been dated because at the moment, I mean, it hasn't been seen since 1978. Okay. So <laughs> it's been uh, in this. Uh, in the monastery, and well, it was loaned to be brought. There's no folk collections. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, very few, anyway, not in India. Um, so it was brought to Delhi, and then they did the uh, photo mechanical process, they call it, at the time, and uh, uh, copied, had it copied, and then it was brought, taken back, apparently. But uh, uh, you know, because I've done quite a bit of talking to people in that area, and they um, they did say that you know sometimes texts were loaned for this process, and then they didn't come back. But I think it did come back because the fellow who told me about the silver um, writing, he was quite young at the time. I, I saw him in uh, 1980, so and, and, uh, he didn't tell me about it then. He was a, a young fellow then. Told me many 20 years later, and he uh, so I assumed that he saw it when it had come back rather than um, it, it disappeared in transit, sort of thing. So I assumed that it's still in Sikkim, but uh, and then it could be analyzed, but you can't get in, it's um, it's, it's locked up. How did you, because you said that you were looking at the start and the old uh, manuscripts yes. and the British Library, so how did they write? <laughs> I'm going to have to be very diplomatic here. You know? <laughs> <laughs> have quite a few Chinese people. <laughs> um, yeah, it was taken in um, the early 20th century by Europeans. So was uh, French, uh, British, and uh, German as well. They found them in the caves on the Silk Road, road and they'd been, uh, hadn't been opened, the caves hadn't been opened. Um, 
and that's why they're so well preserved. They're, they're in really good condition. You know, I can handle them easily. And the paper's good, and the ink is good as well. Uh, ink deteriorates over the years. I mean, it hasn't deteriorated. It's Chinese ink. Um, it hasn't deteriorated. So it's quite extraordinary. But they were, yeah, they were taken. Do they actually seal the ink into a case? Yes, it has been filled into a case. Yes. Source. Yes. We don't. In, in, in some container or? No, just piled up. You can see the picture. If you look up, uh, Pelio is the French name, P E L L I O T. Uh, there are there's a famous picture of him sitting there with this mountain of scrolls. There were more than uh, texts uh, next to him. I think he was working by candlelight. I'm not sure. But he didn't have much time and you know, he was in a bit of a rush. But uh, um, they, yeah, they were kind of just lying there. And he was even, I mean, that's why 100 years later, I'm still at <laughs> you know, There's been several generations of people. Um, Trying to have, get some of the must have used some preservation. I mean, in the British Library, they must be keeping it in very yeah. special conditions. Also, the theory, no? I can't tell you exactly where. <laughs> no, I don't want to know security <laughs> reasons, but uh, yes, it's in a special room that has um, it's made to be like a cave. Uh -huh. And in fact, we have to be quite careful um, telling uh, people that you're going to go down there. To, because if you happen to get locked in, it's a special contained room. If you happen to get locked in, um, you probably wouldn't survive. <laughs> because <laughs> they, they reduce the uh, oxygen and the temperature a little bit and make it very dry. And it, it seems to survive very well. So they don't digitalize these things? Yes, you can find it online. Um, IDP, International Dunmore Project. Uh, if you just I just Google IDP PM. It gets you there. And, uh, you can then, you have to, it's not a very, at the moment, it was an early website, so 20 years ago, um, sort of prehistoric, really. And then they're in the process of uh, updating it now, you know, TEI. Okay. Um, so, but that will take a little bit of time. It's constantly been done. At the moment. Um, and don't be frustrated if you do log on and it doesn't go through, because we refer to it as grandfather has fallen asleep. <laughs> <laughs> because he does, and then somebody needs to do it, and then it comes alive. So it's, it, yeah, that's why they need to make a new one. But yeah. while it's working, it was working this afternoon, um, you can look at the, uh, uh, the actual text. It's quite interesting. Not all of them. They're, they're still in the process. They're hoping to finish by the end of March. I'm not sure. <laughs> so, a question over here. Um, my understanding that there are multiple excavations. They were, they yes. were part of your parcel. Yes, there were as well. Yes. Uh, all the Stein. Stein is the name of the explorer, the British one. Okay. Yeah. It's T E I N. Was he Hungarian? Uh, yes, I'm not sure if he was. Are you Hungarian? Yeah. Are you mentioned that just uh, the Tibetan album in Oxford? Uh, is that the uh, Tibetan album um, in the Peace River library in yes. Oxford? Yes. I've been there. Oh, have you? Oh, okay. I want to. I, yeah, didn't mention, I didn't mention that just now. Tibetan album. Oh, uh, there was a picture. There was a picture yeah. from yeah, the Richardson picture, yes. Um, that's all online. Everything that they have there is, in fact, you, well, unless you wanted special permission. Can I go to the library? Which library? Uh, Peace River. Peace River, River. yes. Okay. Yes, you have to write to them uh, and, and ask if you want to see the Tibetan material, the Tibetan album. Um, but it, it's been well uh, digitized. Um, I'm not sure whether you would see anything more by actually going there, but you're, you, you are welcome. There, it, is, there, it exists for researchers. So it's in the pictures, only pictures. Yes, the Tibetan album is pictures. In the pit rivers, they do have some Tibetan items, but they're not terribly interesting. It's, um, it's a sort of higgledy piggledy uh, It's not a serious collection. The Ashmolean has quite nice pieces. 
there's Ashmolean, it's, yeah, if you go to Oxford, and they have some nice tankers and um, uh, some statues and so forth. Yeah. They also, if you find something online that's not on exhibition, you can ask to um, have it seen. I have asked to see it, yes. but you have to make it. Who is Kamapashi the most prolific writer of all the Kamapa incarnations? No, I'd say the eighth Kamapa. The eighth okay. yes. Um, it, well, they, it's, as I said, we've got about 40 now. Um, they did say at the end there was about um, at least 100 works one time there are references back in history oh there's a hundred oh, actually works but um they either that was an exaggeration or uh they disappeared he did it mostly when he was in exile in that yes. island yes so it's been nothing basically yes well in kucha as well he wrote he started writing that seems to be where he started writing then on the uh, yes on the island a good opportunity to uh, write there and then um, I think he also, he, he doesn't put where he was writing, I remember in the Colophons, unfortunately. Um, but also, well, certainly poems he wrote, so, so there are quite a few of them. Uh, and he may well have written you know, the final years in, uh, and so forth as well. Uh, he had about 10 years at the end, very end, and so forth, before he died. Yeah, yeah, nobody's really studied them much. Everybody, not everybody, but a lot of Tibetan writing uh, refers to him. So, great. He was sort of a miracle worker, I suppose. And that's where a lot of the respect comes from. But um, and they say, oh, you know, it's fantastic. But they don't, as Kapstein remarked, the American scholar, uh, they don't seem to actually read him. Yeah, so, it was considered more of a legendary and yes. practice as Salah then actually his works is yeah. tell your point. Yes, well that's true. Yes, yes, nobody uh, translated much. Um, and I've, I've well it's half the book, so not uh, perhaps not now. But it's yeah, it's quite cute stuff. <laughs> <laughs> He's more the practitioner and sort of putting it all out like not the intellectual uh, very carefully. Although there was structure to the the limitless ocean. From this book, this book comes, and then out of that, this one, and then that one. So it was quite a structure. In a time, <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, it, this has been recorded. Uh, I will try to get it onto the SOAS um, uh, YouTube channel, uh, in which case you, uh, you would need to uh, probably look at the uh, SCI, SOAS China Institute website in order to find the address. Um, uh, yes, if you, oh, you registered through the, um, there was a registration function, yes? Well, then, then we should be able to trace you. And, uh, yes. I don't want to promise too much, but we'll try. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you. Um, thank you very much for a wonderful and uh, uh, very uh, uh, fertile, intellectually very fertile uh, lecture tonight. Thank you. Thank you.